Yes, uh, yeah, let's let's get started then. So it's it's officially nine o'clock where I am, um, eleven o'clock for in conference time, and um, I hope everybody is having a good conference. Um, we are on day three of Open Aperio, and it's my pleasure to introduce another one of our screenside chats. Um, I our bios are all up on the Aperio webpage, but we'll, I guess do a quick round of introductions. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Scott, I'm the board chair of the Aperio Foundation Donc je suis à... and uh, I'm also... Je suis président administration de la, de uh, la I Fondation... Hear... I can hear our interpreter at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure if there's maybe an audio issue. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm the board chair of Aperio. I'm also the provost of Athabasca, Ed, sorry, deputy provost of Athabasca University in Canada. Um, and I'm going to just walk around the screen in the order that I have us here. So uh, Deb, perhaps you could introduce yourself as well. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I'm Deb Bryant. Uh, I'm presently uh, work at Red Hat, running the open source program office, which is located in the office of the CTO. I have a long relationship with open source. I uh, uh, got my deep roots in education and open source working at Oregon State University at the open source lab there, where we ex uh, had opportunities for students and learned so much from students about from, uh, open source. And I'm very pleased to be included in the panel today. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And Lucy. Hi, I'm Lucy Appert, and I am the director of the Office of Educational Technology um, in the College of well, School of Arts of Science, Arts and Science at NYU. Um, I'm a former board member at Aperio and have worked for many years, uh, really on the user coordination side of open source software projects um, and trying to uh, bring together the needs in communities um, and the creation of some of these projects. And I work a lot now on open educational practices, um, particularly the creation of open learning objects and, and um, OERs. So it's very exciting to be here and be part of this conversation today. Excellent, thank you. And I feel like we have all flavors of, of open. We were talking a little bit just before we got started about open access as well. And, Oh, and I work in an open university as in an open admissions institution. So there are many different flavors of open um, in, in our community. But we are here today to talk about open source software and open approaches and the extent to which they've been a part of some institutions pandemic response, um, but not everybody's. Um, and really, how how do we I don't want to say deal with that, but um, how do we respond? Um, when a, you know, I think a large number of institutions did kind of pivot to commercial proprietary solutions. And I believe some of the other talks from earlier in the week have highlighted some of the dangers that might be down the road as a result of those strategies. So what do we as, as open source communities do to respond? How do we maybe amplify our messages? Um, and what are the emerging lessons for us as we move into this new or next normal? <laughs> um, but maybe we could start just with a, a, a little bit of a pandemic reflection, not that we're out of the woods yet, but what are the kinds of characteristics that we think more resilient institutions have displayed? And um, who's, who's kind of weathered the storm better over the last year and a half? And I will throw that to either of you. <laughs> well, I can start with my limited observations uh, because I'm certainly not working in institutions, but my experience with those that have been the uh, institutions that were uh, had a mature environment for doing distance learning, of course, had an easier transition. That was probably key. Uh, an example would be Brandeis University, where uh, as a, a board member of the Open Source Initiative, we partnered with them to develop an open source technology management course about a year and a half ago. It's the first one. And uh, that's a post-grad series of courses. And they had a long established uh, distance education platform, but the rest of the school didn't. And so when the pandemic came, 
they became kind of the competency center for figuring out how they could keep their students engaged and how they would continue to operate. And I, I can well imagine that being the same situation in, in other campuses. So that was one of the key things I saw. And then, of course, very thoughtful uh, development of strategies to keep students safe. I, uh, much work going into what a return would look like uh, to, to hold hope while they were still operating that they could uh, keep their commitment to keeping students safe and returning to operations when time is ready. Yeah, you know, one of the things that struck me uh, over the past couple of days is hearing that other institutions have seen the same things my institution has seen. Um, and I think one of the things that um, can make institutions either more resilient going forward or really in a bind is the degree to which they had the capacity to own their own products. There were so many learning products that were created over this remote period. Um, and, um, and you know, these are done in vendor proprietary platforms. Actually, several people made the, have made the point that many of these platforms are going to make more money from storage fees than they do from the actual licensing anymore. People have lost control of the metadata, the ability to um, put these products together. They've got a lot of silos going on. Um, you know, our institution is, run, is running Kaltura. Um, we have a video repository where we can put our videos, a lot of products being made um, right now. And I think one of the, the questions that came came out of this is like, is where we see resilience in just a few months, because a lot of the hasty decisions that were made to get people ready for remote education were quick vendor decisions. Let me just go and buy this thing um, where we outsource privacy. Um, and we also outsource things like storage. So, you know, I think an important point from the privacy panel yesterday was that um, these are going to come back home to roost and there's going to be a recoiling from a lot of um, of the remote practices that could get us further in terms of the types of um, distance education that Deb was talking about and being able to make that more part of our um part of our curriculum. So I think the institutions that were really at least had some ability to control um, things like storage, things like data, often using open source solutions are going to come out ahead, more ahead and be more resilient. There's a, there's a kind of um, paradoxical danger in here around the institutions who have weathered the storm better are those who've made substantial investments in technology, in distance education, online education, but with that, the digital competencies and literacies that go with it. Um, and, and perhaps also ensuring that sort of digital awareness and digital leadership is baked into their organizational structures. And if we see this kind of backlash as a result of the, the choices that have been made during this time, the, the, maybe the impetus to continue investing there will be a little bit different, difficult. I mean, I think there's no doubt that everybody knows there's a kind of good business continuity reason to do it now. But the extent to which um, online learning will, will be popular with learners in a number of cases and therefore how happy they will be to see portions of tuition, particularly in countries with quite high tuition fees, going on something they didn't have a good experience with. That's that's going to be quite a tricky balance, I think, for, for some of those institutions to walk, especially as those fees rise, as they will, <laughs> no question. I mean, maybe they'll, they'll come down a little because the volume of usage isn't so much, but once you're on the hook, you're on the hook. One thing to be very mindful of in my experience, so I worked in the public sector for state government and then at a public university, is to be very mindful of your contractual agreements and understand what the life cycle of these commitments are. Because the time to revisit the decision is not two weeks before the contract expires. In fact, if you can find a champion in the university to track that and be very mindful and stand up discussions to normalize conversation around what could happen, what could we replace with, has to start well before the flip will switch, right? And so uh, I really encourage uh, anyone on campus to understand what, what those 
obligations are, what the life cycles are, anything in uh, their technology portfolio that they may want to evaluate and put those on a, a calendar and, and make a plan to start leading discussions early in the process. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think from the, um, from the faculty and user standpoint, the questions that we always want people to ask are, how do we break up? How do we get out of this? Can I take my products out of this platform? Where does it come out in a user readable format? Can I redo it? And you're going to often find if this becomes part of the procurement process, um, you're not going to hear the answer you want to hear from that. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I think a lot of us have lived through the flash apocalypse um, in higher ed and we kind of we kind of know that you should ask those questions. But I love the idea of the calendar and of just imagining how it ends before it starts. I think that's so important. Um, I, I have a whole conference keynote in me on procurement if anybody ever wants to give me one. <laughs> But it, it absolutely is. It's 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 an area I think as institutions we, um, I'm talking at a sector level. There are people who do it very well, but at a sector level, I think it's an area where we we don't do it particularly well. Um, I am famous, infamous, for reminding um, companies when they offer me access to their beta products and product advisory committees that I'd like a discount then because I'm giving you free product development. My, my staff are <laughs> going to come and give you their intellectual capital, so you'll be dropping the price. Um, but yeah, the, this this tracking of the things that we use and spending the time to really explore the landscape and understand what our options are. I do worry that far too often we use a competitive procurement process to explore the options, which is entirely the wrong way to do it, particularly if there is an open source option out there or or variety of options out there. That that analysis of the market and the as, as you put it, Deb, the kind of what could it be for the future? What are the options for us has to come well before we get into any formal process, because the risk is you walk into a formal process in a position of lesser knowledge from a start. But, but the, the other danger, of course, is that once you're in a competitive process, you probably have ruled out open source at that point because very few companies have the capacity to bring something through an RFP. There are very few companies in this space. I mean, I think people like Moodle might or a Moodle partner might or um, a Sakai partner might, but the, the number of options, you've closed down your number of options quite rapidly by that point. <laughs> I could talk about procurement for far too long. <laughs> but I think, how how do we go about um, identifying open source options and acquiring them? Because I think that's something I do hear people ask about. How do I do it through an RFP? And I have to say, well, you don't do it through an RFP. But then what is the process? Because I think people still need a process laid out for them. Well, most institutions have an RFI process. And you can make friends in procurement early on, if you can ask them how you might use that vehicle to look for solutions like that. I recall a, a colleague in France who inevitably replaced the, uh, the um, equivalent of the IRS's systems in, in France, did so through doing an RFI and uh, based on open standards. And so they were able to reach out and Set a, set a benchmark with systems, not necessarily folk, you know, targeting open source, but open standards. And so an RFI process uh, is uh, is less threatening, is easier to reply to, and you can help educate your procurement and contracting folks in, in the process. That's, that's one idea. If you want to do it in a more formal way that becomes institutionalized. And Lucy probably has some other ideas in terms of networking or reaching out to domain experts or sending people to user groups. Uh, it just depends on the type of application. Yeah, I think one of the things that struck me uh, across a couple different presentations I've seen 
uh, over the past few, couple of days is the role of education and the role of embedding education um, before you have a decision process. So, um, and I've heard the term frictionless a couple of times, which I think is really important because um, sometimes an open source choice can be a little overwhelming in the sense of like, you have to have a place to run it. You have to figure out, there are a lot of questions about, can who do I ask at my institution about this? It's not a well-defined process. Um, and so, you know, I was interested in, to hear um, the process on, um, the process that uh, J Johns Hopkins is using to begin to educate across the spectrum. Um, because um, if you, I think procurement works well in silos, right? You have a domain expertise, you have your three issues, you run your three checks and you're done, but there's not the area for, um, there are a bunch of areas that you also need, also different box ticks you need to have. And so embedding that kind of education earlier so that the endpoint user, the person asking for the thing, is not the person that gets overwhelmed with all of those questions, is not the person that has to go out and figure out, ask a, a million questions. And I have been that person before. I'm actually that person right now and a couple of different things we'd like to bring in to get rid of some proprietary software. And it can be really daunting and it can see how people can give up. So I think education across the spectrum um, that's not, that doesn't usually a spectrum that doesn't usually follow what your normal procurement process is. So you may have to make friends in research computing. You may have to make some friends um, yeah. in data security. You may have to make some different friends that don't normally get brought in this early in a process. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think a whole campus approach, if you can get there really lifts all boats and makes uh, uh, targeted procurements easier because you're normalizing and love, uh, raising the level of comfort at the institution. I'm a big fan of the, but Minister Fuller had uh, a theory you talked about was called tab trimming. Tab is the little tiny thing on the end of an airplane wing, the smallest flap or the little tiniest thing in, uh, uh, on the rudder in a, a large boat that actually changes the direction. If you use the big flaps and you tune them too soon, you'll, you know, the airplane will just come to pieces. So large institutions are like lar you know, large planes and large boats. You can't really turn them quickly without creating so much disruption that the plan is apt to fail. So these incremental changes in thinking, whether you can find a colleague in research, which is just a, a great idea if you can build competencies based on where your institution is starting, my experience at Oregon State University was that we you know, they have really fine curriculum today and open source, but when we started the open source lab, which was a place that undergrad students worked, the faculty had no interest in actually teaching open source. They thought it was a little niche and you know not too much like other engineering. And it was actually the students that made the case for the curriculum to be added. So not only do we have our colleagues in research, we're now doing research on the Linux kernel because that's where it lived for a long time. We had the students championing and it did make everything easier. We even created a competency center for Drupal because that was the application the university uh, uh, adopted. And all that really started in a financial crisis. That was what originally drove the university to open source. And then they started building competencies around it. And having more people involved across the institution makes a huge difference, Lucy. I'm really glad you raised that. I, I can't help but connect the, the reference to students to your little opening video, Lucy, as well. And one of the thoughts that went through my head when I was watching it was, I think some of our focus has been very much on, uh, to date, has been very much on the enterprise software space. And I'll pick on the LMS since we're in an ed tech space at the moment. But how can we use enterprise? How can we use open source in enterprise? Um, and I wonder whether the opportunities are different. Um, I, I'll be totally honest. And apologies, Chuck Severance, if you're watching. I don't like LMSs. I think they're quite boring. I think they're quite boring ed tech. And I don't think that they do an awful lot to develop digital literacies and competencies on the part of our students, particularly in a very datafied 
digital world now where you need to be more than just a user and a consumer of a system in many ways to play an active role in society. Um, and so the space for open source in innovation and in learning and teaching, I don't think is in using an open source LMS. I think it's in using open source in the in the guts of the teaching and learning act activities themselves and that was something you touched on in your um in your opening video so can i tap on you to say a little more yeah i have one good story from this and and um deb's deb's account was reminding me of this so um you know jupiter notebooks are um an open way now of doing research of doing publication, um, of doing and of doing teaching and learning, and um, it is so fundamentally um, open source in the idea of anyone can take this and um, grow from this work. Um, it is around reproducibility and around transparency, but it can be really hard to. And so you want students to use this, right? And all of our research faculty are using this. This is um, kind of how you publish your data now for data science. Um, but it can be really hard. People get stumped. Like, how am I going to do this? Um, how am I going to do this around my campus? So um, a Jupyter Hub is wonderful because it within your campus allows you to share information, but also allows you to hook in and share information in other places. We didn't really have infrastructure for that at NYU. Um, and, you know, I, I trying to get a Jupyter Hub in place went over and knocked over a bunch of servers under people's desks, right? And there was always like a bootleg WordPress on there too. And, um, and so trying to, um, trying to figure out like, how do we send, how do we work together? How do we create a teaching and learning space? Everyone could rationalize the research space. There's a great project called um, Zero to Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes. And someone in our research computing area found this, got it up and running. And suddenly we hit the pandemic. Not only were we just, or not only were we able to bring in real life data sets, real life research projects through Jupyter Notebooks, right? So students are getting real education on, on emerging problems, emerging data sets. But also um, we were able to put in packages for creating um, teaching boxes. So the kind of stuff that normally is in proprietary software for teaching code, people would solve the issue of um, install day when everybody's remote. Um, you know, and that could be a nightmare that could go on for forever by giving students their own boxes on servers. Um, zero to Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes solves this by allowing you to install places for teaching Python, for teaching R, lots of different areas. And so suddenly we were able to teach coding remotely. Um, and we had something that was not just proprietary learning management software, but software that was giving students experience in um, Jupyter stuff that they're going to use when they go out into the world. They are engaging with real life products, like, for example, Bloomberg, a hometown New York City um, journalism outfit uses, publishes all of their data um, in Jupiter. So I think that that's a good example of kind of what this next generation of imagining teaching and learning. And it means that we have to collaborate. We can't just be in a teaching and learning software silo. We have to um, be collaborative with our large computing research clusters or whatever you're doing if you're in a smaller institution. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear what Deb's perspective is, is on this, but I think that it means busting down the silo of custom built teaching and learning um, software and imagining how we make these platforms more, the, the um, pr platforms we use across the university spectrum more open for teaching and learning. Uh, no, that 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 is a, a great story, and the the opportunities to build interoperable systems, even if people are working in silos a bit. But the idea that it's it's open source, and you've now you know speaking of frictionless, you've now created an opportunity for these things to work together more naturally is it, huge. Uh, it, it takes someone with a, a bit of vision, uh, but there's there there's so many stories like this that are exemplary. Uh, and, and the more stories you have to tell and the more you can have people who are directly impacted by it, including students, tell those stories, it will help your institution be able to move those kinds of uh, projects forward. 
Uh, and just, I mean, I, you could just be creative. But we, I think one year we had a our entrepreneurial school at the university had an open source business plan contest. We just found, you know, anybody in the place that could to could bring home the value of open source into their discipline. And so that's, I mean, that's a, a bit, you know, a bit farther up the stack, so to speak. You know, it's not down in the IT layer, but it brought the conversation back and, and helped uh, bring awareness up of the importance of open source. And that was, you know, over a dozen years ago. You know, everything is uh, certainly uh, emerged since then. And you're right, today, the, the yesterday, the last generation, the, the folks who now had started companies and sold them for millions of dollars that came out of the, the university system uh, are followed uh, by digital natives and uh, engineers that have an expectation that there should be no friction in their development environment, that they should be able to you know, sew these systems together. Uh, and I, I would highly encourage that approach. It's an architectural approach. But uh, wouldn't it be great if someone like uh, Sai Chandra you know, floated that idea at a national level to create a national standard for architecture and, and education. Just a wild idea. I would adopt that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm smiling at the mention of Jupyter Notebooks because um, one of the things I was involved in pri prior to my role in Canada was at the University of Edinburgh, where one of the keynote speakers earlier in the week, Melissa Highton, is, is still, we work together very closely there. Um, she had the... Uh, job of trying to be my boss, which I, I really, <laughs> I sympathize with anybody who tries to do that. But we, we one of the things we worked on there was um, a national service, a Jupyter Notebooks national service. Um, it's available, it's supplied by the University of Edinburgh to the whole of the UK education sector. It, it's branded as notable, but it's entirely based on Jupyter Hub. It's based on Kubernetes. So it's it's dockerized or containerized rather, um, and and I love that model where institutions with capacity can create services that they can offer to the sector as a whole. And I know if we have um, French colleagues on the call, this is something the ASAP Poptai Consortium have been doing as well because. This, this is for me is one of the real sweet spots that we have where we can leverage open source to build for our own needs and, and drive it according to our own business requirements. But we can ensure for those institutions who don't have resource, who don't have capacity, they can still play and they can still play in a way that they're comfortable with. They can buy a service with a service contract and, and some hosting and all of that stuff. But but we keep the money within the sector, we keep the expertise within the sector, and we keep that control of our own destiny, which is one of the comments I think we made at the start. The institutions who've had more control over the product are, are sometimes the institutions who've done, done better. But one of the things that we did both with uh, Jupyter Notebooks and with um, WordPress actually, and we released the, the piece of work we did with WordPress as open source, was we built LTI con um, connectors for them. Because one of the barriers that I have seen over and again is the administration overhead where things are not well integrated. Um, an, you know, an academic colleague's willingness to pick something up and use it in a teaching and learning context is often very tightly bound to how much work they're going to have to do to set up accounts and distribute information to learners and so on. So creating that larger architecture that you spoke about, Deb, and that, that frictionless access to some of these systems, that actually took us into a space where we had very much a blend of commercial and open source. It was a commercial LMS connected to actually quite a large collection of open source things that enriched and enhanced the learning experience. And that's a wildly exciting space for me. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that. <laughs> but how do we how do we help others get there? How do we how do we develop this this kind of space? You mean in terms of, of creating uh, or sharing institutional capacity? Sharing capacity or, or back to that education piece. And we have touched on open source project offices a little bit in some of our conversations. So maybe we should 
um, open up that a little bit? What might the role of a, an open source project office be in creating this more future focused, innovative learning and teaching environment that, that we can see the potential for? Well, it certainly could be a, a place where you can start to normalize uh, the use of open source you know, throughout the campus. You know, I would typically start by identifying where it's already being used. That's how I got started. Someone wanted to pass a law in the state of Oregon requiring all agencies to use open source. And someone called me up and said, what? What is this? What is open source? Why, why would we do that? And my first step was actually to find out that the state was using a lot already. It's a, it's a great way to start a conversation, to assess what your competencies are, to find people who are already educated and, and create, uh, if nothing else, create some kind of a, a community of, of participation, a community of interest. Uh, an open source program off sounds like a very formal thing. I mean, it can be as, as little as having one person whose role in, this, in the institution who may work for the uh, the uh, university's CTO or CIO, who has that that charge to develop a program of education, but showcasing the things that are already happening are are important, and also bringing in peer organizations. I mean, at Pericon is just a perfect platform for these kinds of discussions, but on the campus themselves, just to bring in. Uh, People, any in any any organization, whether it's government or in the private sector, to talk to someone who has to get up in the morning and be accountable for the same things you are, who's either held up to public scrutiny or has PL responsibility for a thing, to talk to that person who's already taken that risk and made some strides is really important. So I think in a very important role in any kind of a formal uh, program office is to start with education and, and championing what exists to expose the institution to their peers that have already you know made that leap and then you'll find natural connections to work on on projects together it's a uh, it's, it's 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 one way to go about it I would think those would be some ideas you know as, as Deb was talking I was thinking about how um, there was a whole generation I think of people who got involved in open source by working on their institutions projects as students um, you know that opportunity to be a student worker um, in IT or to contribute in other ways and I don't think that that's a role that's a, a, a large pathway in a lot of institutions now in terms of having um, kind of rec recognized uh, pathways for for contribution. Um, although, as Deb said, you often don't know where that's happening, but there's not also an emphasis on giving back. And so I, I, I think that one of the important education um, pieces of this is the, is the uh, idea, and I feel like that this is a larger scale problem in academia because there's a real emphasis on the academic side around IP and around the selling of IP. Uh, we have so many people who have been anxious about, you know, their, their lectures, their IP, and like what would happen to that. It's a completely different mindset, I think, than um, what you have around the idea of contributing and collaborating and building on the work of others, even though we know that that's the heart of scholarship. That is what scholarship is, is you you check out the foundations that, that are there and then you do innovation based on that. So I think that there's also a really strong education piece here. Um, in terms of like what, what we are asking students across the board, I was excited about the Wikimedian in residence from, from University of Edinburgh and the idea of knowledge production. But I think, you know, in our computer science classes and our engineering classes, um, are we having them take a look at explicitly open projects and contribute to open projects? Before we push making your own whatever, are we are we um, emphasizing this idea of collaboration? And is it do as I say and not as I do? Um, are you having um, professors who are giving away their lectures, right? Making them available. Um, our computer science classes, the, the 101 level, which is always super oversubscribed, all of their materials are available open on the web. Um, all of their materials are available for the students to look at, review, 
later on. So I do think that there's also, there's the need for this kind of like remover of obstacles office. Um, there is actually a teacher's college at Columbia. There's an office called Removers of Barriers um, and they deal with lots of stuff. Um, so I think there's a need to remove the barriers, um, but there's also a need on the intellectual, the teaching and the forward facing part of the institution to embrace the reality of what of what education and what scholarship is, which is collaboration, which is contribution, um, and which is being part of a larger community that is working towards something, right? And so that, um, so I think that that is also a really important part. I was excited to hear that that's a piece of the um, Johns Hopkins schedule as well. You know, you remind me when you're talking about using open source as a teaching platform and collaborate number of ideas, collaboration and contributing back. There's a couple of campuses in the U.S. that have formalized a teaching program based on student contributions to humanitarian free and open source software. For folks that aren't aware, you probably have heard of this, but it's just one of the most remarkable things. And the seed of the idea of doing this actually came in part uh, based on social science where they were ruminating over why it is we have so few women in engineering, such a dramatic fall off in the last decade or so of the number of women approaching engineering and science and STEM uh, careers. And one of the things they discovered in the software engineering space and programming space was that young women weren't interested in engineering or science efforts that didn't have some kind of value to humankind, that they were more attracted projects that had some kind of public benefit, some kind of humanitarian aid. And so uh, at a couple of campuses, they've created programs where the, the student come in and learn about open source and, and have an opportunity to pick a humanitarian project to contribute to, and that's the teaching module. So they get a two for one. They get the student gets used to the idea of contributing to society, doing something beneficial. The classes have like fifty percent women in the classes, which is a, a you know remarkable plus for uh, inclusion, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, and I think it's a really wonderful model and example of the kind of thing you're talking about, Lucy, which is to get uh, get us thinking more about collaboration. I will say that I, uh, in my, my short tenure in academia, where I had the privilege of being a principal investigator in a couple of research projects, I, I ran into, at least in the United States, I ran into the constraints around being able to publish research and how some of that was captured. And I couldn't share the way I thought I would be able to. And just, you know, to like talk out of school a little bit, when we were trying to figure out how to sustain the open source lab, the first response we got was, you should sell your IP, which of course we all burst into laughter. <laughs> but the, my, but that, is, that is an institutional mindset and an expectation. I don't have an idea how we can break the back of, but the expectation that a uh, faculty member is measured by the, the, the research dollars they bring to the institution, but the, but the intellectual property has to be sold, which is built into some of the, the, the granting structures in the United States, mm -hmm. is something that's very difficult to overcome. And it's not conducive to the, the value, the very values that uh, academia in general supports, which is collaboration. Uh, and especially when you work for a public institution where you're a land grant university and your role is to help build community. Uh, that that was always a challenge for me. I'm sure other people are working on solving that problem, but I, I have to say, Lucy, I agree. That's uh, antithetical to collaboration and open source for sure. And I think with my Europe, oh, I was going to say with my European perspective, I think that's stronger in North America as a, as a cultural thing than it, it certainly is in in Europe. The UK probably sits in the middle of those. I'm aware of our time, and, and and Lucy, I don't want to cut you off here, but we have two minutes, and we have we have a, had a question, and I think it draws on what one of the one of the um one of the words that we, you used there, Deb, which was inclusion. Um, the opportunity to reflect the breadth and diversity of our student population and all the different types of knowledge that, that they bring, all the different ways of knowing that they bring, um, particularly working in a Canadian context with an Indigenous education kind of um, 
agenda. This is this is highly important. How do can can is this a space in which many more people can participate and bring their whole self? So I'm going to throw that out as our last question. Jen, uh, sorry, Lucy, apologies for cutting you off there. But, but if we could maybe respond to that, that would be great. Sure. Well, I'll I'll, I'll start very briefly, and I'll say yes, abs absolutely. I believe that open source represents an opportunity for people, including those that cannot afford a university education or can't go as far as they would like to. Uh, and it's in it in its best moment, open source is in, inclusive and presents the opportunity to develop skills and to have those skills known and to participate in communities. This is a highly, highly valued uh, talent and skill. In, in every sector right now, it's just exploding. I, I'm talking, you know, I'm living the experience of seeing, you know, the high demand for people in that space. And that will include people that do not carry a traditional degree, but have had an opportunity to learn, to meet people, and to establish their own repu positive reputation as contributing in some of these projects. Yeah, I actually was going to speak about inclusivity before, so it was a great, great uh, connection. So, you know, um, one of the great things about open source software, I've seen this many times in teaching and learning projects, is that you can customize it at the institution level, institutional level in response to users. And so uh, we saw there was a great presentation yesterday on universal design for learning, um, reaching all learners and all pathways, um, using customizations in Sakai. I've seen this happen many times. No one, no vendor usually comes out there and with a, you know, with a product that's going to like figure out pronouns or do name coaches um, or um, many of the things I can think of that began uh, as open source projects. So that closeness and the ability to customize and then share back, right, to, to solve problems, I think is really important. Another small piece of this is um, inclusivity and the curriculum um, can be really, really hard when you are dealing with uh, vendor supplied textbooks, for example. One of um, our big um, open educational resource projects for which we've had to put in um, an open image viewer and image repository system, open CDRAG and, and Cantaloupe um, at NYU are around art history. Um, because it's very hard to find um, art history that's not given from a Western, from, you know, kind of a Western or even Northern Atlantic perspective. And so reimagining how to teach those courses requires the ability to collect different types of images and host and serve them in a robust way. So I think that there's a whole spectrum around inclusivity that um, open source, open products really promote. Thank you. Uh, and I'm aware we are a couple of minutes over our allotted time. I suspect we could probably go on this for another couple of hours, but unfortunately, <laughs> we don't get to. I think the one takeaway from, from listening to the, our conversation and enjoying our conversation this morning has been really there. there is no magic bullet here. They, they, we need to be much more adept at working across the scales. So yes, keep an eye to the big procurements and the the enterprise infrastructures. But but uh, to your point, Deb, look for the small opportunities. Look for the little things and the the ways to align things in specific disciplines or where there's a keen champion. And be prepared to work across all of those scales from from big to small. Um, there there's no one thing we can do here that will will engage our institutions with open source. It's a range of tactics, I think. I'm going to offer a last word to both of you. <laughs> no, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to have the conversation and remind us to mention the upcoming software expo before we head out. I was going to do the same thing. This has been a great opportunity. I'm so glad to get to talk to you, Deb, and with you and Marie. No, thank you. It was an absolute delight. Um, wonderful to be here. Wonderful, wonderful to be able to attend a little bit of Open Apario as well. I think we're all of us. The blessing of a remote conference is that we get to juggle a conference with the day job. Hurrah! And like when we used to go physically away, at least we could pretend the day job didn't exist for a while. But, but yes, um, upcoming Software Expo, eleven forty-five to twelve fifteen. 
the links will be in our long site platform so please do go and check things out thank you everybody for joining us i think we had over 50 on the stream it was a pleasure to have you with us and enjoy the rest of your day thank you so much thank you bye thank you bye